Okay, well, hello. I'm here with Casey Michelle, as always, and David Asher, as mentioned, senior fellow at Hudson Institute, uh, and someone who is who's really deeply involved uh, in transforming uh, U.S. economic statecraft uh, in the aftermath of 9/11, uh, and not just in response to 9/11, but but across the whole spectrum of, of threats that the U.S. faces, really. So, David, it's it's fantastic to have you on the podcast finally, um, especially uh, this week as we're as we're sort of remembering the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the way that the many ways that changed the world. So I guess to, just to kick us off a, f- a first question, actually, just to sort of set the scene uh, before this huge juncture in history, before this massive effort uh, was undertaken by the US government, what was what was the state of US economic statecraft uh, pre 9-11? Uh, how did the US use what you, what tools did the US have at its disposal uh, to put economic and financial pressure on adversaries? How did it use them? Was it, was it doing that at all? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, there were um, an initial effort uh, related to terrorism finance that emerged, I think, around 1993. Uh, there had been terrorism financing actions uh, going back to the 1970s against the Palestine Liberation Organization. And uh, uh, the, there had been you know, the uh, actions that derived primarily from the Trading with the Enemy Act against foreign adversaries like the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, China as well back in the uh, until until actually ironically in Tiananmen after Tiananmen they lifted lifted a lot of the restrictions on China uh, which is mystifying to, to me but um, uh, what really got people's attention was the initial uh, uh, for Al Qaeda attack on the World Trade Center in 1993 uh, people uh, I think uh, as we look back on 9-11, we should forget, we can't forget what happened in 1993. It was orchestrated by a guy named Ramzi Youssef, uh, who's a, uh, who was a, a relative of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was uh, to, uh, I think he's Ram, Ramzi, might have been Khalid's nephew, actually, uh, or vice versa. I always forget. I think it was his nephew. But uh, he did that on order some Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Assad bin Laden. Um, and they came close to, closer than people realized to knocking down uh, one of the trade centers. I think it was the South Center. I can't remember which one actually got hit in the parking lot. If they had knocked it down, uh, it probably would have fallen into the building next door, according to the people I talked to. And you really could have seen what happened on 9-11 happen, you know, many, many years before. So, you know, the, the, there was an effort uh, begun uh, on a variety of levels in the wake of the World Trade Center attacks. Uh there was an organization uh, that I became quite familiar with in, in different levels called Alex Station. This was the CIA special. Uh, um, uh, st- they created a whole station uh, like they have in, you know, targeting foreign gov- governments like Moscow Station. But this was a virtual station uh, targeting Al Qaeda globally. And it was very important. And, and attached to that w- was a financial element. Uh, that I'm really not at liberty to illuminate, but it was uh, important and began to gather data. Uh, and it was run by an extraordinary uh, CIA officer, a, a close friend of mine who prefers to stay in the darkness despite his retirement. Um, uh, that uh, uh, effort um, drew on uh, years of work on, on, on financial intelligence, terrorism financing uh, 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 that the CIA had done Um uh, folks at Fort Meade, in their own capacity, had made a very significant contribution. Uh, but it, it's important when you think about the history of, of, of taking action against terrorism financing, to, we can't fail to acknowledge, as difficult as it, as it is to give them proper credit, the intelligence community and the incredible officers, including non-official cover officers who function within the world banking system to collect intelligence at great risk um, and many hostile domains, including in places where Al Qaeda was active, present. We had a, uh, uh, so the financial intelligence was always part of the operational approach to combating uh, terrorist organizations. Um, It it, it had been uh, uh, used, unfortunately, at a rather limited level against uh, Hezbollah. Um, you know, of course, Hezbollah was the first to bomb our embassies and and to uh, kill American soldiers. In, in 1983, 231 Marines were blown up in a, in a, in a barracks uh, bombing in Lebanon where they were on a UN peacekeeping mission. Um, uh, people started to uh, uh, develop uh, financial tools uh, 
the sort of theoretically uh, involving the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. That is the act that to this day is the center point of all uh, pressure activities, be it uh, uh, the work that you've done against kleptocracy. Um, in large part, it's played an important role, uh, uh, abetted by the Magnitsky Act, but of course it's been the center of our terrorism financing efforts. And um, that started to emerge as a uh, more prominent tool uh, in the late 80s, but it really accelerated with the first World Trade Center uh, bombing. Uh, and then uh, things got uh, very uh, um, aggressively inclined in the wake of the 1998 bombings of our embassies in, uh, in Africa. Uh, it was, uh, you know, the, the, this, that was a real wake up call. And, um, uh, one of the things that I recall from that period was that the financial intelligence actually was a predictor. Uh, uh, one of the things that helped predict the money movement was one of the ways we asked, understood uh, the attack uh, and were able to implicate specific people. Uh, that it also happened, if you read the uh, report from the Cobar Towers attack, to, which was the last major Hezbollah attack in 1996. So following the money uh, has always been an important part of counterterrorism. Uh, but in the wake of 1998, uh, we uh, everything got stepped up a notch. So even before 9-11, things were moving uh, uh, into a more aggressive domain of collecting uh, worldwide wire transfer information. Um, you know, and of course, after 9-11, uh, I can explain how that massively accelerated. There are some things that have been declassified that I can refer to. I was going to say, David. Obviously, you know what you're describing is this this growing awareness, awareness, the swelling awareness throughout the 1990s in the lead up to to 9 11. You know, we have a number of attacks, and you know, it's you, you know, you, you just mentioned the the the, the bombings in, in in Africa. My my aunt, who's an American, was actually just a few blocks away from the Tanzania yeah. uh, embassy, so I was very very grateful that she was safe um, during that entire period, entire uh, or, ordeal. You know, we have this growing awareness, growing emphasis, growing toolkit, and certainly growing skill set as it pertains to tracking the financing and understanding the linkages within these financial networks as it pertains to the ties between illicit finance, uh, um, you know, uh, anonymous financial flows, and then terrorism. I'm wondering, before we talk about the 9-11 attacks themselves yeah. and then everything that came after, what were, if you can remember back to that period, I'm wondering on your end, what were some of the big challenges that you faced in terms well, of I mean, technical and, uh, capacity, you, structural, a lot of things also crystallized also. I, I, the, the terrorism financing world was uh, certainly crystallized by the 98 attacks, and I'm, I'm glad that you're your aunt uh, survived it. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, we, 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 we did lose more people and we really, especially a lot of host nation uh, nationals, uh, people, foreign service uh, officers uh, are always supported by locals and a lot of locals died in Dar es Salaam and Nairobi. Um, the, uh, uh, the thing that really got my attention and the attention of a lot of people was an effort uh, to go after the finances of Slobodan Milosevic. <laughs> Um, there's a guy who was not only one of the greatest kleptocrats in history, but he was also a total killer. Yeah. You know, he was a he was a he was a he was engaged in a genocidal, homicidal, you know, uh, wave of mass killings in Kosovo, mm -hmm. and uh, that had taken up a huge amount of bandwidth during the Clinton administration. And, and then in 1998, Leon Firth, who was the national security advisor to Al Gore, the vice president. Um, uh, stood up a pioneering effort uh, with a number of uh, people, a guy named Jonathan Weiner, who played a big role after 9-11 mm -hmm. uh, as well uh, and, and before, um, but really was one of the guys who shaped the architecture. Uh, Will Wexler at the, at the National Security Council, who was, stood up the first terrorism financing effort uh, with a guy named Jamie Metzl, who's gone on to be famous in, very, in various other ways, including really the coronavirus research. Um, but um, th this was all done by it under the guise of a guy named Richard Clark, Dick Clark, who was amazing, one of the greatest uh, individuals I've mm -hmm. ever seen in government. Um, uh, they were doing this on the terrorism side of the house, whereas on the Milosevic side of the house, um, uh, Firth basically did the first economic war plan that yeah. I, I can recall uh, since World War II, or at least uh, attacking the supply lines in Vietnam. He put together a, a white list and a black list. The black list were all the cronies of Slobodan Milosevic, all the bankers, everyone, everything from banks to bakeries to counterfeit cigarette fa factories to anything illicit, illicit. Anyone who was on Milosevic's side uh, was, was it became part of an operation called the Matrix. 
And Operation Matrix literally was a matrix where you put all the sort of people who were Milosevic, you know, sidearm type individuals, sidekicks, and including the killers, the, the, the people who he was paying to do mass slaughters uh, in Kosovo uh, and in, uh, in Serbia, but uh, mostly in Kosovo and um, against Muslims. And, and then and then the, we had a white list of all the people that who opposed Milosevic. And um, Joint Special Operations Command, you know, Delta Force, SEAL Team 6, uh, I, uh, and, and other units uh, took on uh, uh, these uh, – the, these target sets, and they literally bombed the banks. They bombed. They t- took out the financiers, mm-hmm. they, or they grabbed them with special operations. Um, and uh, then I didn't get involved directly. I was involved a bit as a consultant uh, to the Treasury Department. But the Treasury did something absolutely astonishing. Uh, Rick Newcomb, the head of OFAC, who was uh, was around under me uh, when I was working uh, under such a follow on terrorism financing and illicit financing, which were at large. Um, Rick uh, went to a Suzanne Hayden from the Department of Justice, as I recall, the Cyprus, where Milosevic had about $3.3 billion. Yeah. And without having any specific uh, uh, thing that uh, really fas- allowed this, basically they went with the president's orders, as orchestrated by Leon Firth, and they went to the central bank and the governor of the Cypriot central bank, as I recall, and met with the prime minister or president of Cyprus uh, and basically said, you're going to freeze $3.3 billion or we're going to cut Cyprus off from the whole world financial wow. system in like 24 hours. Make a decision. Wow. And they had no law in their country that allowed them to do this. Really, they had sort of an emergency powers act you know, mm-hmm. for a war, uh, but they froze that money. And I can tell you, it was only a couple of months later, Milosevic walked in. He basically, he was ruined between the physical effects of the bombings, okay? Something that when I led the economic war to plan development with, uh, with under General Allen against the Islamic State, this was sort of my inspiration because, we, you know, we, we recreated the matrix literally mm-hmm. um, and back in 2014, 2015 with uh, General McFarland, my colleague on the ground and I, I commander in Iraq and Syria. But our model was going back to what we did against Milosevic or what our country did, and then including going after the big money that was locked up. Right. So like, the, you know, the, the, we not only blew their finances up, we built up the opposition's finances. We destroyed his finances and financial backers uh, and financiers and literally killed some of them. Um, but then we froze his nest egg. So his kleptocratic nest egg that he'd stolen was taken away from him. And uh, he, he, he uh, I know he was interviewed at the at the Hague uh, as part of his prosecution about this. Mm-hmm. And uh, my understanding is he basically said that he was broke by the financial war campaign. Yes. So that showed you what we could do. This guy had killed 600,000 people. I mean, you know, we're talking like, uh, as I recall, something like that, hundreds of thousands at least. You know, I don't know if we ever know the total. But I mean, he was, it was, he was a genocidal uh, maniac. Mm-hmm. And we brought him to his knees. So before we brought terrorists to their knees, effectively, we, we you know, this, those techniques that had been developed in the early uh, stages of the war on terror started to be applied uh, against, uh, you know, nation state level, level actors. And, and, and that wasn't forgotten by any of us uh, when 9-11 hit. I was going to say, David, just just before I turn it over to Nate to talk about 9-11, it's so funny because, you know, when you think of here we are 20, 25 years after the crisis in the Balkans, obviously due in large part to Milosevic's regime, we think of him as this kind of genocidal maniac, things like Serbinica, you know, you know pick and choose. We don't remember yeah. him per se as this kind of arch kleptocrat as well yeah. with these success stories that you just mentioned. I mean, you know, Transparency International named Milosevic as one of the, the 20th century's great kleptocrats, but we don't quite remember him yeah, as such. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you guys remember. I mean, he because he's really a, he's you know, guys like him are still around. And exactly. Be, and I think it's why your initiative is so important. I mean, like this, this is like, so you let the kleptocrats go really out of control, yet you can end up with terrorists, uh, people supporting terrorist organizations. Mm-hmm. You can also end up with states doing, um, uh, taking, you know, ridiculously disgraceful actions against uh, innocence. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the money feeds their egos. I mean, you know, and it, it, it feeds their ambitions. Um, and, 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 and in some ways it can make them sort of crazy. I mean, I've seen this in the kind of drug work I've done. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that the, you know, the, at the end of the day, drug trafficking organizations are a business, but the, the richer you get, the more you feel emboldened to just 
commit massive violence. I mean, we saw this Pablo Escobar saw it with Chapo Guzman. You know, he said, we, we, my, my team at DEA went after him twice. The second time it, it worked better than the first time. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, the, the money side of this is is never is never taken seriously enough. I find, uh, uh, and 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 had and we were, had we taken actions like against Milosevic in the early '90s that were consistent with the actions that were taken after six years of uh, basically ineptitude mm. you know, that the, the, the Clinton administration had no idea what to do. They tried sanctions. They didn't work. So, you know, sanctions themselves, they, they, they started to pioneer in the smart sanctions, which sort of specifically designated financial institutions. Sometimes you got to go well beyond it. Mm. Sometimes you got to you got to aim for forfeiture, not just for freezing money. Uh, and you got to use other tools, and, and, and we call it value-based targeting. We, 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 we wanted to get inside Milosevic's head and make him know this was he was done, and we did. And I, mean, I don't take credit for it, but you know I was involved in uh, helping some friends who were, in, you know, in part of it. So I had a little bit of background involvement. But the people who did this, from the Department of Justice and the, and from OFAC at Treasury Department, were pioneers. And you know, I'm glad to have worked with them uh, later on in my career. Yeah. It is fun. That is fantastic, uh, David, to hear. You know, not only was the, were there early efforts, these early efforts that you were involved in against terrorist finance, financing networks, but also against some really instructive and interesting efforts against, against kleptocrats like Milosevic. But the theme of today's uh, episode is, is, of course, 9-11. And so you've described sort of the broad spectrum of maybe powers you had and actions, sorts of actions you were taking pre-9-11 to get inside these illicit financial networks, what is it, dis, dis, detect, disrupt, destroy. How yeah. did all that change after 9-11? Um, I think that term it, it, may, it, may well, have come I mean, about first after 9-11. The, 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 we, some of the best intelligence we had about the attribution of al-Qaeda uh, uh, supporting uh, and committing uh, in, uh, 9-11, one of the very, uh, one of the earliest sources of insight was money movements, and that's in the 9-11 commission report. In fact, we had, we we're watching money movements that were disturbing before 9-11, uh, and we were watching uh, physical gatherings of, 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 of al-Qaeda members, uh, uh, and uh, this, these gatherings were associated also with fundraising, and one of them, of course, occurred in Malaysia. Uh, it was really a planning meeting, but they also did, uh, and I don't think anyone's really ever talked about this, but they also were engaged in some sort of, you know, raising raising some funds, uh, at least at the Sheikh bin Laden level. Uh, he wasn't in Malaysia, but the, many of the hijackers were to to basically put a price on destroying the United States and allies. Um, and I mean, physically destroying like cities, killing mass population. And uh, th that I hope uh, with, and I'm very proud, uh, pleased to see that President Biden has uh, uh, were demanded that the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation and uh, other agencies to classify the intelligence surrounding material support uh, from a wide variety of places that was went into the specific attacks on 9-11 uh, that, that occurred, and then, frankly, to attacks that didn't occur, that we, we prevented. Uh, and I was uh, you know, involved in one of those. Uh, my, maybe one of the most significant ones was... Uh, what they were planning to do in Asia before 9-11. So the only part, and I, I share this because I, I, I don't think I've ever spoken about it. I don't think anyone really has, but it's the truth. Um, no, we were so, talking about this before we came yeah, on. This is we really put our embassies in East Asia on, all, all, on a high state of alert before 9-11 because we saw those plotters meeting in Malaysia. Uh, and with our intelligence partners in the region, we were following them. Um, we also had a group of uh, Pakistanis uh, linked to Al Qaeda uh, who entered Japan in late August, or early September. I can't remember of of two thousand one. Um, uh, in reaction to that, uh, Assistant Secretary Kelly, uh, with uh, my my assistance uh, and our, emb our embassy's uh, support and the Japanese government support, put our embassy on absolute high alert. We had a armored cars blocking the streets around it. Uh, we had a helicopter flying over it most of the time. Like, I mean, this was never done <laughs> normally, no. but we were that concerned that they were going to execute what had been known to us as the Boinjinka plot. And the Boinjinka plot was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's goal of flying uh, with bin Laden's enthusiastic support of, of attacking, you know, between seven and nine cities in a wave, global wave, where 
You would knock down buildings in Singapore. You would knock down buildings and, and attack our embassies in Singapore as well. Uh, uh, Thailand was suspected, Malaysia, uh, the Philippines, Japan. Um, and I think we even had some threat information with Australia. Um, it, but, you know, we, we, we thought when, when 9-11 happened uh, and I found out, uh, my wife called me and said some plane just hit the World Trade Center. It's like, you know, I was, my first reaction was Al-Qaeda. I was like, mm-hmm. this is, but I was like, is it, gonna, is it happening in Asia too? Um, and it didn't happen in Asia. And I happen to think that our actions may well have stopped it. But one of the ways we were, we were following the uh, pattern of attack planning was following the money. I mean, it's hard to get into the details, um, but it gave us a, it gave us, when, when large amounts of money move for a objective, you know, they used to call them weddings, you know, they've changed their, you know, their words over the years. Um, you know, we suspected something, something big was going to go down. And, uh, you know, we saw financial movements consistent with the attacks uh, and uh, and we also saw movements not just from Al Qaeda's uh, charitable accounts in places like the Al Haramain Foundation in Pakistan, um, and with its of course its offices in Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Um, uh, but we saw uh, money moving to support some of the outer lying elements of Al Qaeda in places like Asia. Um, uh, but the, but the, but you know so so I you know. The money was one of the ways that we could ascertain that something was up, even if we did couldn't pinprick it. You know, we couldn't pinpoint it uh, the way we should have. I mean, as you know, 9-11, uh, in hindsight, because everything's better in hindsight, uh, was p- partially predictable based on SIGINT that had been received by the National Security Agency, but had not been processed and disseminated, as well as information from the FBI. But a, an area that, that, that also... Uh, would have given us more uh, um, understanding would, would it was that if we had had a larger effort to track money, uh, we probably could have uh, gotten closer to identifying the attacks before before they occurred with more precision. And, and so when 9-11 happened, um, within days, a huge effort on the terrorism finance front was stood up at the National Security Council. Uh, and I was part of it. But I actually was m- more involved. I mean, people always think that I was like intimately involved. I was pretty intimately involved, but I didn't just do terrorism financing. I took on the role as the task force, basically leader uh, for going after Al Qaeda across Asia physically. You know, with 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 you know with all the, 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 the special operations units and uh, our. Uh, uh, um, our allies and partners and the CIA. And so I, I actually sort of went to war with Al Qaeda in, 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 in my region, uh, East Asia and Pacific. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the finance part, of course, was there. And I had gotten asked uh, very early after 9 11 to be read into a program uh, that was affiliated with that uh, by the Deputy Secretary of State, Rich Armitage. And, you know, I, so I, I am associated with sort of the early group. Of people, but I was really more on the fringes initially because I was so f- focused on Al Qaeda and then North Korea. Uh, and um, you know, a lot of the work that we did on North Korea, where where you know we were aware in 2001, uh, the summer 2001, we started to become aware that they were working with the AQ Khan Proliferation Network out of Pakistan and. They were uh, pursuing an enriched uranium nuclear weapons program, um, and, and they were doing it with a with a with a country that we all considered a state sponsor of terror. I still find it incredible that they've never been fully uh, <laughs> designated yeah. as such. Um, and uh, you know, th- th- you know whether there was going to be an Al Qaeda linkage. Of course, people speculated. We weren't really convinced of it, but you know, who knows? We with the North Koreans, they they've worked with terrorists for years. But so I started to develop. Um, a very advanced capability centered around the Defense Department, uh, as well as uh, you know other government agencies and government intelligence agencies, to follow the regime finances in North Korea. And ironically, it was it was it was that effort that became a bit of the model for the counterterrorism finance effort. Uh, and 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 then we had another thing which we can talk about in brief, and, and that was the, the incredible work that was done by uh, the uh, the. Uh, the intelligence agency, uh, you know, Treasury Department, and, and the uh, CIA, and 
FBI to uh, get inside the SWIFT wire transfer system. Uh, it was m- led by the Treasury Department, um, and uh, that was an incredibly controversial and gutsy thing. I mean, uh, they and, and this is, you can read about it at, I think it's tftp.gov. I think the, the, the terrorism finance tracking program is on the Internet. It's audited by the European community, uh, and that remains a vital capability. Uh, uh, um, and, and you know, and, and but but the funny thing I recall from that effort and from the parallel effort that I led inside the Defense Department with states cooperation was we was was the how do you process all this information? I mean, it's so great you get all this data, right? You know, uh, you know, we, we have XYZ trading in Dubai's wired money to Al Haramain, Al Haramain Foundation, Al Qaeda's one of their main fronts, wired it to some country, you know, for some attack. Um, well, you know, it's great if you can get 800 million swift messages a month, but it'd be a lot better if you could read them. (laughs) So one of the things I went to work on actually was the ability to use machine learning and AI at a very early stage for processing data. Um, it was, I, 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 I I sort of demanded we start to create certain capabilities because we just, we couldn't, we were going to drown in big data, a problem Mm -hmm. which exists today. But, uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, understate the importance of the work that was done uh, after 9-11 by a small group that, you know, I was sort of on the fringes of, uh, led by Juan Zarate Mm -hmm. uh, from the Treasury Department, who was the first uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Terrorism, Finance, Financial Crime. Uh, he, his, his, his effort with Danny Glazer, who later, on, later was an assistant secretary, they, those guys um, uh, with, uh, uh, again, Rick Newcomb from OFAC, they, they, uh, and, and uh, a number of others, um, uh, David Offhauser, George Wolf, these were the, uh, they, these were the, the pioneers uh, of the financial war. And you can read a lot about, about it, a lot about it in uh, Juan's books, uh, Treasury's War. Um, uh, but, and, and, you know, I, I the, the key element there that uh, needs to be noted is the pioneering work of the de- development of the USA Patriot Act, which had already been in draft. Mm-hmm. It wasn't called the Patriot Act. It was going to be a massive enhancement to the um, uh, Bank Secrecy Act, um, uh, which it doesn't necessarily perceive, uh, actually protect bank secrets. It actually allows us to extract <laughs> secrets from banks. <laughs> Um, in many aspects, and it, it, it was the basis for FinCEN, which monitors it's sort of our global uh, financial intelligence yeah. network uh, with a, a banking system uh, and, and OFAC. But uh, the Patriot Act uh, uh, was um, uh, legislatively partially in draft and then was rapidly updated. And the big tool that Juan uh, and company uh, uh, with, with David Affhauser as legal counsel's uh, great uh, assistance and, and leadership um, put forward was such section 311 of the Patriot Act, which allowed um, uh, the, a banking institution to be uh, cut off from the United States for illicit conduct. There were a whole different variety of, and this was done, done as a regulation. So actually, we created a regulatory capability to impose uh, basically a, 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 a more or less a financial. Uh, kill decision against the illicit actor mm-hmm. uh, or type of actor or category of actor or even nations could get designated um, whole countries like North mm-hmm. Korea or uh, you know uh, you know others uh, uh, the, the, you know Latvia later on for kleptocracy primarily uh, was <laughs> was designated for a while <laughs> uh, so so the Patriot Act was a pioneering thing it's, it's it's frequently thought of as just this great huge surveillance. Act and yes, of course, that was part of it. The whole warrantless wiretapping, a lot of the stuff that sort of was used in between the lines. But um, from a, from a counter illicit finance standpoint, it, it, it was a seminal piece of work, and it was done remarkably quickly uh, by a small group of people. And you know, I certainly don't claim credit for the Patriot Act. I was aware of what was going on, uh, but uh, they deserve a lot of credit. Sorry yeah. to wander around there. No, 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 that, no, 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 no that was David. fantastic, Casey. 
I was going to say, it is very clear. I know, Debbie, you just mentioned hindsight. Everything is clear in hindsight. But as you also just mentioned, it does seem very clear two decades on that the Patriot Act not only was at the time, but continues to be in many ways the greatest single piece of anti-money laundering legislation, to say nothing of a regulatory framework, that the U.S. had yet passed and arguably the world has has ever seen. Um, yeah. uh, one of the things we're talking about off mic, David, and I know you just talked about many of the decisions, many of the policies, many of the successes in that post 9-11 environment through that first especially decade, you know, kind of through the 2000s, um, many of the successes that the U.S. encountered, thanks to you, thanks to your colleagues. One of the things that we were talking about off mic, while we still have about 10, 15 minutes on the uh, this, this episode to go, um, one of the things we were talking about is this growing, I guess, realization of the relationship, or maybe not even growing, maybe it's always been there, but prominence of the relationship between the kind of kleptocratic governance structures uh, and terrorism and terrorism financing, especially. Mm. Obviously, much of that came home to roost in 9-11, and it does seem that in the post-9-11 environment, there was that increasing realization on that. I was, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that relationship, some of the lessons yeah. you have learned and seen on your own own end, as well as your well, colleagues. I, mean, you're gonna, as I well. think we're going to learn a lot if the president gets this, uh, to, to, if we get this declassification. You'll see the incredible kleptocracy involving the, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. the government of Pakistan, uh, 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 religious uh, donors and madrasas um, affiliated with uh, very wealthy people, uh, people uh, like Dawood Ibrahim, you know, uh, he's thought mm -hmm. of as sort of an arch criminal and a terrorist, uh, you know, for his attacks in Mumbai. Um, but, uh, you know, there was this cesspool of, of, of people, uh, um, and many of whom, you know, drew their inspiration from the ultimate kleptocratic terrorist organization in history. And that was the Pop Palestine Liberation Organization. I mean, it was huge. I mean, billions and billions of dollars of money, almost all derived from illicit activity. So it was beyond kleptoxy. But, the, 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 you know, when, uh, you know, the, 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 the Arafat, the leader of the PLO, was worth billions. And how the hell did he get billions? You know, like all these donations from the Saudi government, from from uh, uh, you know a, a, a wide number, wide swaths of individuals around the world uh, who supported his uh, terrorist activities, uh, but it, that was a uh, a, a great example of uh, of the intermingling, uh, and 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 it, and, the, and it was in a great example of the between the state and state protected actors like the princes in Saudi Arabia were giving money to the Saudi to the PLO to attack mm -hmm. the United States, okay. But it was like a type. It was a type of kleptocracy, I think, in my view, because it was that that was their form of. Um, I mean, the, the money was they were stealing. I mean, sometimes even stole the money. I mean, we had a <laughs> case where one of the biggest sources of support for a Hezbollah, one of their biggest actions, was money that they had actually stole out of a mm -hmm. bank. Um, I mean, so like you know, there is a there is a line between the terrorist organizations and the governments kleptocrats and the governments. But uh, you'll see, I hope, uh, as these documents filter out, the, the level which it, it became a muddle. I mean, um, they were, they were uh, you know, it, 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 this was like, I mean, you know, killing Americans, especially as, I have to say, as the war picked up in Iraq uh, and, and it's just really in Afghanistan where we have a lot to think about as the financial advisor uh, to the effort there, um, you know, as we just pull out with the 20th anniversary. But I mean, the, um, the, the Haqqani network, which everyone's hearing about today, I mean, they would go and raise money in like KSA in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and they'd show videos of Americans getting blown up. And people would bet on more Americans getting blown up like it was betting on horses. And it wasn't just Americans, it was British, it was anybody who was a foreigner any foreign infidel. Um, and, you know, again, it's this kleptocracy, not exactly, but it wasn't, I mean, it was, this was like, the, these were people that were like, like you wouldn't expect them doing this. Like yeah. people that are bankers, you know, people that are very wealthy uh, uh, people in the construction world, for example. I'm not going to specifically say the Bin Laden family because Bin Laden was really mm. the one who was crazy in his family. Um, but there were other families, and I can think of several of them I can't name, but uh, who who raised a lot of money through uh, uh, crony crony kickback construction contracts, and then they gave it to their one of their cousins who was a member of Al Qaeda, and they gave they consistently gave donations. 
So well, there was this um, intermingling. Uh, and 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 there there was a competition among Middle Eastern kleptocrats uh, to to sort of uh, see who could do the mo- fund the most damaging act to the United States and others, um, you know. And like I said, with the Hakanis, it came down to specifics, and they're still doing it, by the way. And you know, I mean, I uh, and when they did it, they did it with the, the full uh, support of providing. Um, you know, uh, materials aid of a variety of types to Al Qaeda, their partners, you know. So, you know, and, and, and the Haqqanis themselves are sort of a huge kleptocratic actor. If you think of the way right. they run their part of Pakistan, like it's a mob state, basically. Yeah, mafia state. You know? Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and, you know, we've never really treated them. We never even treated them fully as a, 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 a terrorist organization. We've, we have designated them, but we've never gone after them. We've never really gone after their money. We never, there's a lot, you know, we never really gone after them for their ties to Al Qaeda. Um, uh, but we, 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 but, but, but one, one of the ways we could actually do it uh, as well could be just understanding the kleptocracy, the shakedowns, the, you know, just the, 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 the people in Pakistan that would support an effort, which is <laughs> maybe not a lot of people, are the people that feel ripped off mm-hmm. and are victimized. I mean, these people just, they're just like financial terrorists, you know, taking their tax and all the, all, all the stuff that's going through right. their territory, their, you know, they, 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 and, and they're actively involved in, 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 in a type of inner collusion with the ISI, which is itself a hugely corrupt organization. ISI, the inter- Pakistani's intelligence service, is um, a part of the Pakistani army. And the Pakistani army, by the way, is probably one of the greatest kleptocratic organizations in the history of mankind. I mean, the, the army uh, foundations, which you guys, I think, know a lot about, have been used to fund the ISI. They've been used to fund the Haqqani's activities, and they've been used to fund al-Qaeda. So the Army's own, you know, uh, you know, they have foundations uh, incorporate huge corporate interests. They own cement factories. They own, you know, textile plants. They own all stuff. And, and so this, this the, the kleptocracy surrounding the corruption in Pakistan also directly feeds into terrorism and including on the transnational level. Yeah. So it's a little, I'm sorry, it's a little, uh, it's a little far afield from 9-11, it may seem, but as we deal with one of the big residues of 9-11 is now we're out of Afghanistan. Um, you know, uh, we are going to have to draw the line on Pakistan. And one of the ways to draw the line on them is not just terrorism financing, it's corruption. Yeah. And I think you should make a major effort uh, in your program to target corruption in Pakistan because it's like, you know, and, and frankly, the United States government is part of the corruption. We've been giving them billions of dollars in assistance. I see very little return on that investment. Um, our aid projects have been poisoned by Pakistani, you know, you know, corruption, active kleptocracy for years. I mean, you know, I mean, how much of that money? We, we, we basically have been bribing them to have an overland supply route in yes. Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we're not going to need that anymore uh, if we're out of there. Are we going to keep bribing them? <laughs> for some other reason, because the State Department doesn't know how to stop. I mean, you know, this is another thing that I've learned in the government. And don't underestimate how our own money can be used against us. We saw it in Iraq, huge amounts of money funding uh, roadside uh, ID attacks uh, was diverted from our aid projects and our, in our, in our you know, capacity, so-called capacity building and counterinsurgency work was used to actually fund an insurgency. So, you know, there's, <laughs> and, and, you know, and this, you know, and so, so, so America's own, not intentional kleptocracy, but our, our lack of safeguards and controls on our own funding have resulted in some terrible things. You know, I've been working most recently on what's happened with COVID and how the U.S. National Institute of Health was <laughs> providing material assistance to the very biological uh, weapons related uh, and research programs that may have been defensive in part uh, and, and, and for public health, but they had a very sinister element. And, you know, we should have known better. We, we you know, the communist Chinese are doing the, the things that are with our money that are against us. And th- that's a theme. I think our own sort of um, sort of kleptocratic, you know, uh, it's not it's not kleptocracy it's bureaucracy out of control okay and funding but th- but in effect it becomes it fosters kleptocracy you know mm-hmm. i mean you know i you know and, and and there needs to be real serious research on you know whether america's 
activities to, you know, uh, uh, you know, nation build or whatever have actually become a, a source of kleptocratic growth around the world, whether we're actually sort of, you know, creating our own poisoned well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can say in the world to counterterrorism, it's, uh, I mean, you know, again, how much of the aid do we give to Pakistan that's come right back to be used against us in Afghanistan? A lot. (laughs) A lot. (laughs) You know, how much of the aid we've given to Saudi Arabia has been used uh, to, 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 you know, to, you know, the same people we were paying to work with uh, before 9-11 and afterward. Mm -hmm. uh, We're, we know their fingers were in the, they were, they were, they were guilty, certainly on a financial level. In supporting what happened to the United States, you know I that mean, brings us kind of neatly, yeah. David. Actually, just as we're starting to talk about, you know, the sort of legacy of nine eleven and and what we now know and and the, this this intermingling, this 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 broader sort of look that we have to take at, at the role of kleptocracy and corruption in fueling other threats uh, like terrorism. And you've already mentioned, uh, you know, the possibility that the U.S. was funding sort of dangerous research by the Chinese into into into, into coronavirus. Uh, but looking ahead, um, and it does, this doesn't need to be kleptocracy or even terrorism uh, financing, but uh, what are the kind of major economic uh, statecraft challenges from a 30,000 sort of foot point of view that you see facing the US now and moving sort of into the near to intermediate future? Uh, and, and linked to that, sort of are our tools, are the tools that emerged in the aftermath of 9-11, Section 311 and sanctions and so on, and the anti-money laundering regime, are these up to the job when we when we look at things like I'm going to put maybe, maybe a suggestion for you, but sort of um, you know uh, like cryptocurrency, digital currencies that the yeah. adversarial regimes are developing? Yeah. Uh, or would you like to see? Well, do I mean, we I'll need tell another you sort of revolution? I've been advocating here? for years uh, inside the government uh, to no avail, but I maybe should uh, uh, write about it here at Hudson. Uh, maybe could, is we have an incredible, incredible national capability to track cargo, people, places, and, uh, uh, and, th- and things they carry uh, physically into the United States. It's called the National Targeting Center, run by the Customs and Border Protection. It has probably been involved in stopping more acts of terrorism against the United States, CBP itself, than probably any agency. I mean, yes, I always give credit to friends in the CIA. They've done incredible work. But, you know, a, a lot of people, have, a lot of things have not been allowed to come into our country, including terrorists uh, getting on airplanes, because CBP, working with the National Counterterrorism Center and the C- Counterterrorism Center at CIA, uh, uh, have formed a tremendous partnership. And and what they do is when something suspicious or someone suspicious gets on board an airplane or gets on a, a cargo, gets in, put on a Mirsk shipping line or, you know, one of these huge container ships with 500 containers on it or something or thousands, um, the, the Maersk gets a call or they get an electronic warning. They're told, hey, you know, you might want to check out container 188.53 on deck two or something. You know, <laughs> we literally tell them that. And we offload these containers and we look through for suspicious cargoes, uh, sometimes even humans, believe it or not, people being smuggled in, in these containers, which is crazy. A lot of people die that way. Um, but um, we don't tell banks this. I mean, yeah. we collect all this data, okay? But, but under the Bank Secrecy Act, we don't share. We, have, we even have a provision of the Patriot Act, which allows us, called Section 314A and Section 314B, allows the Treasury Department to share specific data. But it's, all, it's not aggregated data. So, like, I don't understand we just, why we just don't call J.P. Morgan every time we see them – uh, moving a transaction that our financial intelligence systems are telling us is related to terrorism finance or kleptocracy yeah. or anything that's illegal. Why don't we tell them, hey, you might want to file a SAR or stop that transaction. We share very sensitive, highly classified data with United Airlines, with American Airlines, with British Airways, with you know anybody flying in the country all the time. I mean, we're giving them leads, tips and leads. And you say, you get this guy off the plane. Get that woman who's in wearing that whatever, you know. She's she's she's, she's a drug trafficker. or She's known to be affiliated with a terrorist organization. Those people almost never get on those planes. We rarely get shipments that, uh, you know, we, do, we, involve, we involve, you know, terrorist support, which we used to. Uh, before 9-11, the, the, the National Targeting Center does that, but we don't. We need a financial national targeting mm-hmm. center. FinCEN is not that. It can't even manage the data flow 
Uh, people don't even read these suspicious activities reports, which is, of course, impairs the work that you, you know you want to promote against kleptocracy. I mean, you know, um, uh, you know, we have these politically exposed persons, and they're supposed to be you know targeted and documented as well. But the the, the system just needs to be recreated. And 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 I've you know had a vision of how to do that. We could we could create a, what's called a banker's bank. Every service in the financial services industry, you know, I've worked for a lot of big players in the financial services industry in between six times working for the government. Um, we outsource almost everything today. So so the the the, the, um, the you know whether it's you know. Uh, you know, managing uh, credit card payments or interbank payments, or there's this is, there's a, there's a, there's a there's a huge effort in the financial services to outsource to these uh, uh, these groups like the clearinghouse is what is the famous one, which is all the major banks in the United mm-hmm. States have it, and they promote settlement of, of transactions. Okay, among many other things, they have many services. I've tried to convince the clearinghouse for years to get into any money laundering, know your customer. And, um, uh, you know, basically uh, financial, you know, financial, uh, the business of, uh, you know, financial sanctions compliance. And they've refused to do it. They say it's an, their, their members don't want to share data about that with each other. I mean, they share all sorts of data. They share all sorts of anti-fraud data. They share all sorts of customer data related credit cards. You know, I mean, you know, you can learn, learn an awful lot. That data gets pooled. Mm-hmm. And shared among banks as a managed service, or at least banks have an interest. You know, remember Visa and MasterCard are, these, are owned by the big banks. Um, uh, but when it comes to the financial t- tracking data, you know, the, the logically we should create a, 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 a banker's bank. So the banks, the big banks and the small banks, they could all create consortia to pool their monitoring mission. And instead of having everybody replicate an anti-money laundering, know your customer effort inside every institution, why can't they just be consolidated? Yeah. And why then can't the government create a portal that allows cleared act, cleared people in those financial institutions to at least query the government's data to see if there's any reason, yay or nay, we could just create a red flag to be watchful of a specific transaction or actor. You know, we, we do this with shipping. We don't do it. We don't do it with, and with travel, we don't do it with money. And, you know, you want to go after kleptocracy, we start creating a watch list of all the kleptocratic people we're tracking around the world and and, and force uh, financial institutions to proactively take action um, and by merely, you know, reporting on them. But, 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 but you know, we, we just we, – we don't um, – we, we don't really have a, a consolidated way to track uh, illicit finance and terrorist finance, and we could. Uh, basically, that's just a simple message here. And on the anniversary of 9-11, that would be a great way to, 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 to take this, this enterprise to a new level, not to invade people's privacy. Their privacy is already invaded, okay? But this would be to, 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 to create a system. You know, it is a bit of a big brother thing. You know, you think, well, but, but, but if we're doing it in, in, in travel, we're, we're doing it with fraud, why shouldn't we be doing it with illicit finance and terrorism finance and money laundering related to drug trafficking uh, organizations? I mean, again, you know, we, we, we don't we, – if there's no basis uh, for uh, a red flag, uh, there won't be a red flag. But if the government's got something in, in an intel channel that says, you know, this account at, uh, you know, some bank in Dubai – um, that's uh, affiliated with an entity, which is what Sayari does. It tracks the entity. So it's got XYZ trading. Believe it or not, there are a bunch of XYZ tradings. Until we, we started scooping up all the com- commercial registry data, even if we knew that XYZ trading was moving weird money or even tied to a terrorist, we didn't know what XYZ trading, who owned it, where, where was it domiciled, and how was it tied to other companies around the world. Now that problem has been solved, that attribution problem. That is a huge tool in countering corruption and kleptocracy globally too. Because, you know, you literally, the, the, the c- c- corporate registries are a tremendous resource. If you combine the ability to track finances with the track, the ability to track entities and act and those entities, ben- who they benefit, like what individuals, you can create a network that it provides incredible financial surveillance that <laughs> is not necessarily any more invasive than it exists already. It's just consolidated. Well, that is a uh, food for thought for, for future episodes and future work for KI, I think. Uh, we are, I'm not going to give anything away, but we are working on something along those lines. It might not appear in the next few weeks or so, but 
uh, stay po- we'll keep you posted. So, but uh, you but know, I, I, we... I thank you for the chance to think back on nine eleven. You know, it, it, I'd never stop thinking about it almost every day of my life, Ashley. And but it was uh, it was a war on terror that began well before nine eleven, and it's a war that's not going to end on nine eleven of twenty uh, twenty one. I hate to say it. Um, uh, people are fantasizing about this thing. It, it's going to morph. It's going to mm-hmm. change. Um, uh, and it's probably going to be emboldened because the message is that, you know, with the color, you used to say these colors don't run. Well, we, we, we ran and we ran from something that we really didn't need to run from because it wasn't really costing us much in the way of lives. Um, it was costing us money and we should have tightened that up. And uh, But uh, we're going to learn that getting disinvolved from the world opens up uh, 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 the world not only to... Uh, uh, greater uh, forces in the world of terrorism, but much greater forces in the way of, you know, lawless, uh, corrupt regimes that are, uh, um, you know, predatory toward their populations and toward the world system. You know, uh, internationalization is going to be in trouble and globalization at the rate we're going. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the counter kleptocracy initiative is one of the few ways to protect it. Well, thank you so much, David. We've we've come to the end of our time now. I'll produce all... Will, uh, will be poking me if, if I don't wrap things up. Yeah, thank it. you so much for your insights you. today. Thank you for everything you've done over the past 20 years uh, to try and make America and the world a safer place uh, through these financial economic pressure campaigns and investigations. Um, really laid the groundwork for, for, for what our project does and, and what is to come. So thank you again for joining us. Um, okay. And it's goodbye from me and Casey. Take care. Uh, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Bye. David.